Your show will go live in five seconds. Four, three, two, one. Broadcasting live, it's America's longest running talk show on computers. It's Computer America, bringing you the biggest names in technology with guest interviews, new products, and your emails. Listen live at ComputerAmerica.com on any device around the world. Email the show at live at ComputerAmerica.com or find us on social media. Be sure to check out our website for contests, giveaways, show notes, live video stream, podcasts, and more. You're listening to Computer America. Hello and welcome into the Computer America Show. Thank you so much for joining us and welcome into a full hour of our program. I hope all of you are having a wonderful Friday. You can feel it in the air. It is time to relax, have a nice weekend, and of course, we will start that off with a little bit of Computer America. So today on the program, for anyone out there who may be curious or hasn't checked out ComputerAmerica.com, we have Pop Zara's Nathan Evan, and we'll be getting him on in just a moment. And yeah, so we'll be doing that as well. We will have a Facebook winner of the week. Looking forward to that everyone and of course if you didn't enter that don't worry we will be doing it again that's right one more time next month or i'm sorry well yeah technically next month but next week next friday we'll be doing it again but with a new prize that's right we'll tell you more about that next week when we unveil it so we will we will be announcing one lucky listener live on the air here today and yeah so with all of that of course i want to mention a few things before we get into uh, our conversation with Nathan Evans, and that includes ComputerAmerica.com. That is everything you need to. That has everything you need to know about today's show, including show notes, including really just anything else. That's, of course, you know uh, that, that includes everything else, including show notes, articles, links, any and everything that we do here on the show. You can find at ComputerAmerica.com. Just find today's show, and right under there, you'll be able to find. Uh, links, of course, but you will also find uh, just anything else. So, with that being said, uh, unfortunately, right now, uh, Nathan Evans doesn't seem to be on the line. So, we will, of course, have to get started here without him. But, yep, waiting for uh, Nathan Evans, again, managing editor of Pop Czar Magazine, to join us. So, here we go. And I think in the meantime, we have a few, well, actually, uh, of course, some articles that we're going to discuss with him. But then we also have uh, a few things to talk about as well. And actually, you know, before, before that we get started with Nathan Evans, I want to take a moment to mention uh, Blue, Blue Microphone. We've had them on the show before. They've been on the show a number of times. Uh, you know, they've, they've always been very, very kind to us. And we definitely enjoy using their products for the longest time. I actually found myself using a Blue Digital Spark microphone. That was one of their first USB portable microphones and you know it worked admirably until it didn't and it was a lot of fun to use very very easy and had great sound quality well we just switched up microphones today and just yesterday we, we received it we're going to be do, uh, putting it through its paces and of course using it here live on the air and that is the yeti pro micro, uh, microphone it's one of the best and one of the best selling microphones out there for personal use, for broadcasting, for singers and artists. I mean, it's obviously a little bit beyond just the entry level uh, positions. You know, there's, of course, you know, microphones from Logitech and standalone microphones from, you know, a number of other manufacturers out there. And including Blue, they make uh, a number of different ones. But the Yeti Pro, which we are using today, is a step beyond that it's i think the a lot of people's first introduction to mid-range microphones and there are some that of course tip the scale and go hundreds if not thousands of dollars but the yeti pro for the cost to the performance what we can already tell and what we will be of course you know 
getting to know it as we use it here on the show, it is performing very, very well and is honestly, I think, probably the best microphone a lot of people are going to want to get. Because anything beyond that, I think a lot of people don't need that much uh, sensitivity and, you know, all the different uh, features that come with a more expensive microphone. But if you want the best out of a microphone, then, again, the Yeti and the Yeti Pro, and of course they have others such as the Snowball, but I think the, the Yeti Pro about caps off the mid-range, you know, uh, before you start hitting professional musician levels, uh, the Yeti Pro is about the best microphone that you can ever hope for. So, like I said, we will be using this for the uh, you know, for the next couple of weeks and for the foreseeable future, and a review of that will be up on ComputerAmerica.com in just a few weeks. So, now, with that being said, why don't we, of course, get into some of the different news, unless there's anything else I wanted to mention. Um, yep, check out ComputerAmerica.com. We have a few reviews coming out. Of course, uh, we are actively working on the Yeti Pro. We have the... Of course, the Netgear Orbi we will be talking about that is the uh, the wireless the Netgear wireless home security system uh, review. We'll be doing that here shortly, and a number and a number of other projects. Check them out at ComputerAmerica.com. Okay, now with that being said, why don't we just jump into computer and technology news while we wait for, of course, Nathan Evans to join us. And again. We apologize for this, but he should be joining us here momentarily. So, here we go. Computer America and computer and technology news. All right. And I think for our first story that we're going to do, why don't we jump into this one? And, you know, there are a lot of different ones. And, you know, Nathan is, of course, going to help us with a few of them. But this is... This is a really, really cool one, and, well, not just cool, but very important, and this is a story that we've been covering for a while. It's about the NSA, the Na the National Security Agency, or something to that effect, and they had this little project going where, at any time, for any reason, at any moment, the NSA had free reign to wiretap and monitor any person that they felt were connected to illegal activity with foreign agents and of course this was an anti-terrorism an anti-terrorism measure this was to protect everything and anything to do with american interest and try to stop some of these homegrown terror attacks that happen here in america you can think, well, the NSA was one of the leading forces behind the retrieving of information behind the San Bernardino shooters, the husband and wife duo that shot up, unfortunately, a government office and killed so many people, and a number of other ones. The NSA's responsibility is to monitor, track, and hopefully defuse the situation before they can happen. But they drew a lot of scrutiny over the past couple of years because first of all it was relatively secretive until edward snowden of course brought this to light and a lot of americans didn't know that the u.s government was capable of this kind of surveillance and not just surveillance on any number of people or very specific targeted threats but they had en masse this was the National Security Agency was able to track, monitor, and wiretap American citizens without a warrant at any time. And this happened en masse. This ha it was shown that it was being taken advantage of. It was being taken advantage of for political reasons. It was uh, being used for things such as personal relatives or acquaintances or even people that NSA agents wanted to track down, such as old girlfriends. It was being used for that. It had been used for that. And just, it was an, a government agency with literally no oversight that had mass surveillance technology available to it. Well, big news out today for this really travesty of privacy 
where this is reported by the New York Times that the NSA is stopping one of the most controversial practices, which is the collection of American international emails and text messages that mention a foreigner under surveillance. And spoiler alert, there's a lot. There's a lot that, uh, of course, that applies to. So, actually, before we get into this, why don't we try to bring on Nathan Evans and let's get this going. So, everyone, let me just connect here. Just one moment, please. And again, this is Nathan Evans of PopZara.com, uh, Pop and hopefully he can hear me. Nathan, can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? We can hear you. And pretty soon you'll hear all of us. Perfect. I don't know who all of us is, but it's great. Thank you, Ben. Sorry about that. Uh, wonderful connection issues. Thank you, Microsoft and Skype, for your wonderful connection. I love it. No problem, no problem. So, yeah, we are kicking things off uh, in the interim while we are waiting for, of course, everyone out there, if you want to go check it out, popzara.com. You can check out the show notes. We have a link to it there. And, you know, longtime correspondent, so I feel like we can give you a little bit of leeway. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, we were starting with this article about the NSA and the reports coming out today that the NSA will be stopping surveillance of email and text messages uh, of American citizens. So you're kicking off with that one. <laughs> oh, goodness. Okay. For uh, Now, this is a story that I don't think is going to end because they admit it. Because wasn't there also another story that came out this same week that they were trying to put microphones and transmitters inside cats to spy on people? So <laughs> I, I, I did not hear that one. I know that it, like, part of me just feels like this admission that, hey, we're not going to do it anymore. Um, part of me feels like they're doing it simply because – Everyone is buying a smart TV. Everyone is using other means of communication besides email and text that I feel like they have enough collection vectors that they can say, okay, we're not going to do that anymore. We're not getting any good intelligence. Anyways, we're going to be listening through your toasters. So, yep, we're stopping. Like that's how, well, you know, do. you know, Ben, we've talked about this before and I've always said that they don't have, they don't, have, the bar is very low for this sort of thing because the government doesn't really have to spy on you anymore. All they have to do is just follow you on Twitter or Facebook, and they'll get they'll get every piece of information you want, you know. And we and we've also mentioned, and, and sadly, this is this has only exploded more since we last talked a month ago. But the proliferation of these live video things, these live video feeds. Uh, I know Facebook has one powered by, or and Twitter has one powered by Periscope. That people are increasingly willing to divulge all the information you could they could ever want on these things. So maybe the reason they're stopping some surveillance, specifically with foreign agents, is that they don't need to anymore. But and and of course you're you're talking about the trend of uh, live streaming and live streaming getting yes. very popular. Uh, live streaming and people are doing it for the most inane reasons, the most uh, you know mundane things such as just eating in a restaurant or hanging out at home. They'll talk with you know many people. But there's also people who, you know, unfortunately, a couple weeks ago, there was that, uh, you know, the killing of that gentleman that was broadcast live on Facebook that caused a lot of questioning about live streaming. But I think you're right. I, I mean, it's not going away. And all the information that the NSA or really anyone could ever want is in the metadata of the live video that you're sending out to everyone. Well, I think if you actually look at the story we're talking about now with the NSA, I think it ties directly into the last election because there was there was a few controversies that came out not to you know this might sound political but it's actually a very apolitical that one of Trump's early appointee cabinets uh, was a general Mike Flynn turns out that he was surveilled when he was talking to a Russian diplomat we don't know the the nature of that but there was there there is an ongoing controversy right now and I believe it was a uh, with an Obama cabinet named Susan Rice or I could get that name wrong I apologize where it turns out that see what they do is the NSA has permission, so to speak, to to cover the communications from foreign from foreign uh, players. Mm -hmm. And if there's incidental information that's collected in the process of this via Americans, then that information can be used if it's unclassified. Or if, I forget, there's an actual term for it. I think it's called unmasking. Right. And so the controversy is is that that particular information could have been used to unintentionally surveil American citizens, which which opens up a whole can of worms. If I believe that the, the ruling of the NSA right now uh, goes back to a 2011 ruling. So the truth of the matter is the government typically doesn't give power up readily without taking something back. So while I applaud this, they might be saying, 
we won't do this anymore, that might mean they're going to do something else. Right. So, and and, I get... and oh, and and just to put a uh, a little tidbit on this is that of course, don't feel that this is the end of everything. You know, just like Nathan said, don't think that this is the end of all surveillance because obviously they would never do that. Um, the the article from Engadget that we're pulling from that of course is in the show notes. They mentioned a few things, including email providers are using HTTPS or HTTPS, uh, which is a secure uh, protocol and you know much harder to surveil on, as well as many texting and communications apps are using end-to-end -end encryption, which mean that, of course, if you receive the, the message sent between two people, unless you have the keys, which, you know, again, end-to-end, -end, you don't, the message is gibberish, garbage, and impossible to interact with. So, you know, email and texting information, which is, again, what they're specifically saying that they're going to stop collecting, is much harder to collect now than when the NSA was first formed. So, yes, there, a little uh, bit of that. Another, another thing is, is that when, when you, when you, this is why you have to read the government sources directly, because you'll notice if you've ever read a government report, if you've ever read anything that's, that's from that bureaucratic nightmare, they're very specific about things. Because these aren't just memos. I mean, we have a president who tweets at 3 a.m. about Doritos chips, right? Mm -hmm. That's different. But when you have a government agency, the specificity that they give is intentional. If they say, for example, we're not going to spy on you under these particular reasons, that doesn't mean they're not going to spy on you for another set of particular reasons. They could say, you know, if the sky is blue and it's slightly cloudy and precipitation is 63 degrees, then we are not going to do this particular thing. And that means that they're going to do exactly the opposite all the other times, because that that is how these programs work. These programs rely on this massive infrastructure that's been built up over time, and it is not distangled easily, especially with a court like the NSA, which which is a basically a phantom court that you and I will never see. It's specifically it specifically uh, it only collects. I'm sorry, it only uh, convenes when there's a specific request to uh, surveil a particular individual. Right. And we'll never know that. We, we, we don't have access to that. We're not allowed to see that. So when you have a shadow government and a shadow court doing this sort of thing, anything goes. They could, they could be listening to me right now through my Xbox One that's on <laughs> my desk or my iPhone, which is in the back room, and I'll never know. Well, yeah, and, and uh, well, well, we do, and of course, through leaks such as Edward Snowden, through other sources. I mean, we know that Project uh, Prism was you. Project Prism was set up to use Xbox Connects to microphone and you know spy on people using Project Prism. We have you know televisions reportedly being used to spy on people. You know, uh, Samsung in particular, I believe their their smart televisions. Uh, they were able to be on and actively listening. They called it like a uh, hidden angel or something like that. I mean, like these things. Oh, weeping, we, weeping angel, weeping named angel. after the named after the Doctor Who bad guy, which is awesome. So. Right, and, and and we know it's happening, and we know it's not going to stop. So don't go exposing everything. But at the same time, I think companies are oh, starting to wisen up. I I disagree, Ben. I think you should expose everything. A couple of years ago, when the PlayStation 4 came out, Sony put on this live streaming where any – basically the idea was to put everybody into their own television channel. And it wasn't two minutes before people started having sex. Here's what <laughs> you do. If you don't want people to watch you, walk around your house naked. When you watch TV, watch TV naked. Trust me. That will turn them away. So – that's that's Nathan's tips for the weekend. If you don't want to be surveilled, be gross. All right, there you go. Care. No, and and, and uh, yeah, I will not be doing any of that. <laughs> but no, I but I get your point. And yeah, I think we're gonna wrap this one up. But it's very big news that the NSA is reportedly giving up at least a a modicum of their surveilling powers. And you know, of course, they may be replaced by something else. But at least at first blush, this is good. If not the whole story, you know. So, Nathan, and of course we kind of jumped into that one uh, because that was, you know, very, that very, very, very new. But your turn. I mean, uh, anything kind of catch your eye because you have a few. Well, I had a few, and I again, this has been a, it's been a, it's been an interesting week. Uh, it's been a slow week for actual tech news, and the reason for that is because this is the week that most com that huge uh, tech companies that give out their their earnings reports. And the one, the two that grabbed me this week, well, three if you want to count this, 
let's, I want to talk a little bit about video games because there's, there's a catch-all for this. And, and for the benefit of Computer America and your SEO rankings, I'm going to say a few trigger words. Okay. Now, if, if you're listening and you have a Google, uh, Google device, okay, Google, Aww. Mario Kart. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> bing, bing. But, okay, we've talked about this before. Let's get the big news out of the way. Nintendo released their press, uh, their press earnings, and as, as we've talked about on this show before, how did the Nintendo Switch do? Well, it turns out it did really, really well. It sold almost 3 million units. Yeah. The, the, uh, the marquee, frank, frankly, the only game worth playing on the system, which was called The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, actually sold better than the system. Yeah, that that was that was weird thing. Like, was there a Breath of the Wild that was available for like the Wii U, or did no, it li- or yeah, did it there was. Sell, or did did it literally sell more units for a console that people didn't have? Yeah, there was a it was on a, it was unprecedented over one to one ratio. And yes, to answer your question, there was a there was a version available on the Wii U, and my tech editor Herman Exum actually played it on the Wii U, and he liked it, he loved it, but. We're not counting the Wii U version. Forget that for a second. The Wii, uh, the Nintendo Switch version actually sold better than the Switch itself. And a lot of people uh, have attributed this to, to one, uh, they're, buying a co- they're buying a copy of the collector's edition for themselves. It's a very nice collection. And two, they want to sell it. And they want to play it. So it's, we buy one to sell, and we buy one to play. And, and not to get into the weeds or anything, the game was universally acclaimed. It's, uh, I believe it still holds the record for the highest rated game of all time on game rankings or Metacritic or whatever it is. My own uh, Corey Gallagher and Herman, who've talked about it, both said they love the game to death, so it doesn't need my help selling it, right. apparently. <laughs> but the interesting thing is that Sony released their their earnings as well, and Sony announced that they've sold 60 million PS4s. Right. And it turns out that the PlayStation division is pretty much the only part of Sony that makes any money for that company. And they've also announced that they expect to sell less PS4s in this upcoming upcoming cycle, whereas Nintendo is very optimistic. The reason that's interesting is because there was a third company that released their press, and that was Microsoft, who, of course, have their own little video game thing, and they're making a lot of hay with a, an upcoming revision of the Xbox hardware called Codename, uh, what is it, Project Scorpio, right? Yes, yes, sir. You'll notice Microsoft hadn't bragged <laughs> about anything because there was nothing to brag about. Uh, it was bad news for a lot of the hardware divisions. And what Microsoft has done traditionally, they hide their Xbox sales numbers inside their product divisions. And that was down as well. So what we have is we have, a, we have three different stories of the, the, of the health of the gaming industry, Ben. We have Nintendo, who's always going to be here, doing better than they have in a long time. Mm-hmm. You have Sony, who's basically anchoring the stability of the entire industry on the back of this console. Then you have Microsoft, who's in flux. Now, I'm not going to read too much into the Microsoft tea leaves. But we've talked about 4K on this show many times. We've right. talked about what it does. We, both, we all love it. We love 4K. We, and Microsoft and Sony have both brought out 4K-capable consoles. Microsoft is planning to bring out something, again, called Scorpio that's supposed to do native 4K. That's supposed to be very powerful, blah, blah, blah. The problem, though, is that they don't seem to be in a position to push the technology. And so w- the idea would be that they're going to ask developers to develop games that are significantly more expensive to develop on the possibility that they may sell on hardware that nobody has for less money. And that could spell disaster for the video game industry, which is already struggling. The only reason that the video game industry is experiencing a renaissance is because of the Nintendo Switch and Zelda. That's it. Without them, the video game industry continues its slump. Well, and, so, and, and, and mm-hmm. you know, uh, of course, there's more to the video game industry than just consoles. I think PC is going through its own little renaissance there. Uh, actually, sales are down. Yeah. In fact, sales are really? down. Yeah, sales are down. Yeah, sales are down all around. The um, now on my day job, which is the Pop Czar website, we have a monthly feature where where uh, again, my my gaming editor Corey Gallagher and I we talk about a monthly sales report from the NPDs. And now they don't, while the NPDs don't necessarily cover every facet, they give a really good, healthy snapshot. And if you're looking, and again, we just, we just recently talked about the sales of the Nintendo Switch versus the others. And the truth of the matter is, is that the, the idea that PC gaming is the way to go for the future of the, of the video game industry is completely preposterous. It doesn't make as much money. It doesn't even make one-tenth of the amount of money. That being said, that being said, the idea of, of a customizable, upgradable console has always been there. It's, it's, it's happened in console gaming as well. But the, here's how it works. So you have 60 million PlayStation 4s, correct? Mm-hmm. And with, 
in regards to the the PlayStation 4 Pro, which is 4K compatible, the vast, vast, vast majority of them are pretty much a stable set of hardware. So if I'm a developer, I know what I'm getting into. And if Sony treats me well and they have an online distribution center, I know that I'm capable of selling that many. When Sony brought out the PlayStation VR, which is their VR headset, they had, at the time, 45, 50 million consoles that would be compatible with it. That is right. something that, what, that wasn't happening on the PC world with Oculus Rift and HTC Vive. They failed. They bombed. The PlayStation VR has sold better than both of them. By all accounts, I believe it's sold twice as well, which is not anything spectacular either. But if you're going to fail, you don't want to fail completely. Right. You, know, you, wanna, you, you don't want to be first in that race. But that being said, that being said, take something like Call of Duty, for example. Call of Duty comes out, it sells 10, 15 million copies on the consoles. On the PC, the game sells about 800,000. Hmm. You know, and what happens is, is that there's, the PC gaming industry is rife with, it, with, rife with a bunch of problems that make it very undesirable to handle a big budget game like Call of Duty, or to handle something like Batman Arkham Knight, or to handle something like Battlefield. It can play those games, and it will play those games optimally better than anything you see on console. The problem is, Again, going back to the, the problem with VR, that the consoles that are purely capable of running at that 4K experience are very limited. Right. So if I'm a developer, do I develop for that market that is so minute, or do I develop for the broader market, which is less powerful? Every single time, it's going to be consoles. Every single time. For historical sake, to get off this topic, 10 years ago, we saw this happen. We saw the PC gaming, I would say, was experiencing a renaissance in 2004 to 2007. You had big exclusive blockbuster games like Half-Life 2, like mm -hmm. Doom 3, or Crisis that were better than anything you could imagine on a console. And none of them sold very well at the time because no one could play them. It wasn't until that, they, that their respective people brought them over to console that they sold well. Valve, for example, the company I know you love that made Half-Life 2, they haven't made any games since because they've, they've plateaued. The, there's the, there's a joke that Valve doesn't make video games <laughs> anymore. They make money. Well, exactly. But you know what's funny about this, though? Something else happened last week about gaming that I thought was very interesting. And and I, I kind of hinted a second ago that Microsoft may be in a little bit of trouble. Right. Uh, here's another piece of the puzzle, which I think you're going to love. Microsoft released their first game on Steam. They released a port of Halo Wars, the real-time strategy game that right, was available right, right. Yeah, yeah. for Steam. Now we've uh, we both talked about this. Where Gabe Newell from Valve, he's chastised Microsoft. In fact, he built an entire failed platform called Steam OS to counteract the Xbox and counteract Windows. He it didn't is, work. He is a massive supporter of <laughs> Linux. He he does Linux everything. He hates how close <laughs> ecosystem uh, Windows is. But hey, you know he came around. Uh, uh, you know what? I, I I will tell you this. Though. I will tell you this. I agree with everything you just said. But like all people who think things like Windows and iOS are technically closed, then why do they have the most stuff? Because of that argument I just made for you, that you have a platform that has limits on it, therefore you can develop for those limits. That's why when you see things like, for example, when you see things like iOS versus Android, you see things like Linux versus Windows, the one that's more controlled, the one that's more clamped down, the one that has limits built into it is going to be the more successful one. People will pay for, for Microsoft Word more than they will get a free version of LibreOffice. And they, will, just, they will pay for that. And just to be clear, this goes uh, almost 180 compared to what we just talked about yesterday, where we had, of course, um, our all, we had our all Linux show, our Linux correspondent, Marcel <laughs> Gagné. And his, you know, his big point is that Linux is the most popular operating system in the world no. due to Android and, of course, the back end of no. really the... Oh, no. Oh, no, no, that's completely that's completely fraudulent. I will say this though: what he's talking about is what's called the Linux kernel. That yes, there's some truth that the Linux kernel is what forms the basis of things like uh, Android. It forms the basis of even Mac OS. But but that to say that to call them Linux is to basically call a call your lawnmower a car. Yeah, they they both run on a version of the combustible engine. But w but which one are you going to drive on the highway? The fact of the matter is is that the operating system is not the power. And I like Linux too, and I've been an Ubuntu advocate for a long time, but it's over. Nobody wants it. No consumer wants it because there's no, I mean, again, the Ubuntu project was very good at distilling the essence of Linux, which was basically a clone of Windows, into a freely distributable operating system. Now, 
you probably know this too, Ben, but the history of that program goes back to what they called one child per laptop or one laptop per child, right. where they were going to make this Linux laptop that ran, that you could pull a string and everything, and everyone was going to do it. The reason that didn't work is because Android happened. And Android happened because iOS happened. Right. Because what, hap what happens is you can have these derivations of good products, but if they're not supported and they don't have stability, then nobody's going to want them. You can't base and it on it. Nathan, and right there, as we lose every single Linux listener we've ever had, <laughs> uh, the, music, I like the, the, Linux. the music means you have to take a break. We'll be right back with more Computer America just after this. Everyone, stay tuned. We are all Brother Wolf. Ten years ago, a group of locals banded together to create positive change. We took animals into our homes, held adoption events at local retailers, and talked to the community about our mission to help build a no-kill Asheville. A decade later, we have achieved so many victories for animals in need. There's been so much progress, yet there's still so much to do. As part of our year-long celebration, we encourage you to become a member of our special Compassionate Circle program. With a monthly donation of $10 or more, you will have behind-the-scenes access to the work we are doing at Brother Wolf. Our goal is to reach 1,000 members because we receive no government funding. Working together, we can help build and sustain no-kill communities. Learn more at CompassionateCircle.BWAR.org. We are a 501c3 tax-deductible organization. And welcome back to the Computer America Show. And actually, Nathan, before we get back to, uh, you know, we'll, we'll come back and we'll do some broad strokes to wrap up all of the gaming uh, points that we just made. But one thing I want to do, and that is, of course, give away a prize to one of our people who entered on the social media contest over at facebook.com forward slash computer America. Because, you know, if you're going to give away all of your information, you might as well get a free keyboard out of it. So now, uh, you know, I don't think I ha actually uh, let's see uh, drum roll YouTube let's pull that out and all right here we go so and the winner is actually I had it muted so one second and okay, drum roll. oh there you go whatever okay so this I'll do it I'll, you, you, you do you give me the sign I'll do a drum roll let's right. go let's all do right. this and start Amazing. And, and this week's winner is Miss Faye Owenby. That's right. Faye Owenby listens to us in, uh, let me get this right, Blue Ridge, Georgia. So, mm. Faye, if you're listening, we have just said your name live on the air, and you will be receiving a message from us here shortly. And you win this week's prize of a Logitech Keys to Go keyboard. And Ooh. yeah, a, a, um, $70 value. Happy to, to give that away. And next week, we'll be switching up the prize. So, tune in next week as we unveil that. So, congratulations, Faye. Yeah, congratulations, Faye. And everyone who, out there who did not win, well, we, of course, do it again next week. But you can always go check out all these prizes over at Logitech.com. You're, you're all winners. You're, you're all, all winners. Right? Yes, yes, yes. And except, you're, all, you're except, all beautiful. Except not today. You're all losers today. But next week, you could be all winners. <laughs> you're mostly all losers, except for <laughs> Faye. So good job, Faye. <laughs> except for Faye. Right. So, uh, but for anyone just joining us, Nathan Evans, popzara.com. Go check it out. And we are doing uh, some, you know, I'll be honest, some, oh. a, a lot of meandering around the video game uh, industry. One let me just, hey, let me just say this. But sure. Let me get your Linux people back. The Popzar website is actually run on a shared Linux host. So we love Linux, too. We love Linux. We just we just don't we just don't use Linux for our operating system because we like using real programs that you got to pay lots of money to rent from Microsoft. By the way, screw you, Microsoft. I used to be able to buy your programs now I got to rent them. Yeah. That's so true. well, yeah, the subscription model has like so yeah. I mean, you got them all back and then you lost them like three seconds later. So nice try, <laughs> but uh, but but no. I, you know, as I was saying, let's do some broad strokes here because we talked about uh, just real quick the Nintendo Breath of the Wild and the Switch and the yeah. and the PlayStation. So, you know, broad stroke, Breath of the Wild, Nintendo, what does this mean as a console and, you know, for Nintendo? Because obviously a strong initial selling is important, but a console is not made within the first three months. A console is made over, you know, yes. the lifetime of the console. So how is this looking? True story. Uh, when the Wii U, which was the predecessor, uh, you know, which preceded the, the Nintendo Switch came out, it, it itself sold about three million the first month. So Nintendo's on par with that system. 
Now, the Wii U went off to become one of Nintendo's least selling systems of all time. It was not a, quite the disaster, but it wasn't wasn't a typical success. Here's the thing. I want everyone listening, when, they, when, they're, when you're done listening to this amazing program and you like this program on iTunes and you, you share it with your friends, which you should, like Faye, you're a winner, <laughs> go to Target. Go to Target today and look what happens when you go to Target. You'll notice something. Target's been taken over by Nintendo. They have those big giant balls outside all look like Mario faces or Luigi faces. You open the door, it'll say, wahoo, Mario will greet you. The right. shopping carts look like Mario carts. Why? Because Nintendo took over your store because there's an actual there's actually another Switch game, a port of uh, Mario Kart 8, which was a Wii U game that no no one got to play because no one had a Switch. I mean, uh, no one had a, a Wii U. Nintendo games sell very very well, and they sell very well in a way that other games don't quite sell. Even you have something like Call of Duty that sells millions upon millions upon millions. It's almost anonymous because it's replaced every year with another one. Whereas Nintendo can take a three-year-old Wii, uh, Wii U game and it will sell millions more because the, the identity that they have for these characters, the identity they have for this sort of thing, we're talking 30 years old. In the video game world, that's like the equivalent of 100 years because gaming doesn't have quite the, the immediate history of film, book, or, tele, or even television or music. It's, it's a new medium, right. a medium that has been largely dictated by, by the whims of Nintendo, and they seem to have this magic formula that no one else has. Now, I talked about PlayStation selling 60 million units, and that's very impressive. That's something to be congratulated. But but even Sony hasn't been able to to translate that into into new intellectual properties the way the PlayStation 3 or even the PlayStation 2 have. You know, it's one thing to say we sell hardware, but it, you need to sell software as well. And so perhaps Sony will eventually get to that that level where they can do this, but it's very healthy when people are buying hardware and software. It's very unhealthy when no one's buying the software. So you can you can have one or the other, but you can't have both. Um, and call it, I mean, you can't have uh, an absence of both. So, like for example, when Nintendo sold the original Wii console in 2006, sold 100 million, you saw massive amounts of development. You saw Call of Duty games, you saw bloody games, M-rated games. None of them sold very well. It hurt a lot of people financially. Whereas puzzle games and mini games and family games did sell very well. And when and when there was no successor to that, a proper successor, Ben, a lot of those companies went out of business. The video game industry has been in stagnation for a couple of years now, almost a recession. And I, they need this healthy market. They need this competition. And I'm not necessarily certain that pushing 4K right now is the way to go. I don't I don't necessarily think that tr we're in the transitional market yet. That being said, maybe it is. So we're right. going to see what happens. We're going to see what happens. But for now. My, my closing statements on this, Nintendo has a very good opportunity to revive interest in this platform, revive interest in this market. Uh, 4K is not an issue, let's just say that. But they're going to need games, and Mario Kart is not going to necessarily do it. We will see. It's up to them. Right. It's up to them. Right, yeah. And we certainly will see because, of course, uh, you, as you said, you and the gang over at PopZara keep a very close eye on sales and numbers and, you know, do a lot of great work over there. Oh. So, yeah. Let's, uh, why don't we move over to, uh, from video games to Apple. And you have two different Apple stories here where Apple, let's face it, they make a hell of a cell phone. But then when you think about them, they really don't sell a lot, you know, a lot much else because yes, they have the IMAX and, you know, the tablets are, you know, kind of the sales have been drooping for a long time now, but Apple, it feels like they're trying to you know, show some kind of innovation because obviously the Apple Watch, which sold kind of well, but was pushed out by things like sold, Fitbit. Sold well, sold well for a wearable, let's just right. say that. Right. And, and, you know, it was not the thing that took Apple beyond, you know, just a phone company. So here you have two different articles of Apple doing two different things that they previously have not done. So what are these? Now, we're, we're talking the first one about the uh, self-driving car. Okay. And and I think the uh, the term for that is called autonomous technology. Mm -hmm. Now, most of the time when we hear about the self-driving cars, it's usually uh it's it's a field that's dominated by the likes of Google, of course, and and Tesla. Now, we've we've seen entry we've seen entries into that by companies like Uber and whatnot, but I the idea that that Apple would get into this market, I think I think everyone sort of expected that. And if I can be a little cynical about this, and I've said this before and I've said I've been a little pessimistic about things like Apple Watch. And, Nathan, uh, Nathan Evans yeah. being pessimistic? No. 
my cynicism is usually well rewarded. I'll say that. <laughs> but um, I, I, I've never been a supporter of, of 3D. But I like 3D. Mm -hmm. I actually like wearables. I like technology when it works. The, but there's a big difference between putting the technology on a table and making you want to pick it off the table. It needs support. It needs an ecosystem. It needs it needs to have a function and a purpose, you know. And so the the idea here's the thing: we're talking about Apple without Steve Jobs. I, I know we 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 make this argument ad nauseum, and we talk about Tim Cook and all this. Right. But the fact of the matter is. This is something that's very indicative of what Apple does. Apple gets into the market after other people have gotten into the market. Now, the, the idea that Apple would do it better, but how many failures has Apple had? And the truth of the matter is they've had quite a bit. They've had quite a bit, but they, but they, don't, they don't bloat about their failures, and, the, and they don't get held accountable for their failures in the way a company like Apple – I'm sorry, uh, Google, Microsoft, or anybody else would. If Fitbit fails, that company's done. That's what they do. Right. We saw this happen with uh, the rival Pebble. Remember Pebble? They were doing very well, and they bragged, and they, oh, we're doing fantastic. Now they're gone. They got absorbed. They, 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 they disintegrated so quickly <laughs> that they had like offers on table to buy them out for like hundreds of millions, if not a billion dollars. And then the next year, we find out that they sold their entire patent portfolio for like sixteen million or like something like that, like a tenth, pennies on the dollar of what yep. they were once worth. I mean. Tech companies struggle so very quickly, and then you see Apple, who admittedly is a constant, but you know they're still struggling just in slow motion compared to everyone else. Well, again, Apple Apple has a privilege, and that that's called the iPhone. The iPhone sells so phenomenally well; it's it's un it's unheard of for like at the iPhone is perhaps probably the single best selling consumer device in the history of consumer devices, and they've 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 come up with this amazing market. You know, we, we just talked about video games. We talked about 60 million PlayStation 4s. You know, Apple sells that in a year. For iPhones, it costs more. Right. You know, it's, it's, it's not even comparable. But the idea of self-driving cars. Now, on one hand, I'm, I'm okay with this technology because it means less drunk drivers on the road. On the other hand, on the other hand when you have a company like Uber, whose business model is to basically empower uh, unemployed people to have a job by turning their cars into taxis. What that basically is, and I have friends, and I'll just say this, I won't say who, but I have a uh, staff on my website who who moonlight with Uber for to, for sustenance. They need it to live. Right. And they and they'll tell you right off the bat that they're basically beta testing self driving cars. Because once people get hooked on the technology, then then the people get replaced. It's no different than going to a than going to a grocery store and being and having the bagger, you know, the, the teller replaced by the automatic machine. Or the the fast food restaurant. If your job can be replaced by a robot, it will be replaced by a robot. You know, and and, and and we've talked about uh, you know the job loss is going to come through automation. Um, as much as I like people having jobs, I'll, I'll admit when I go to the grocery store, if it's under twenty items, I'll check out myself. I just I don't know. It's 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 easier for me not to deal with people. Um, but I will say this. <laughs> uh, I like people, but <laughs> but but I don't like people. But no, uh, I will say this about Uber. If you are ever concerned about Uber and the self-driving technology, the image that is burned into my mind is the picture someone took of Uber and their SUV that they were testing in Michigan, I believe, flipped over on its side like a turtle because it crashed itself. Like, they're trying, but it's not there yet, so... Of course not. No, of course not. There's room for other, you know, there's room for other well, people to come into this market. I will say I will tell you this though, and to to sort of give a, a an opposite ancillary to my my argument, is that as much as I don't like wearables, you know, we had this argument before about how I I don't I don't really care for them, but my but you'll remember I also said if anyone can do it, Apple can do it. Right. Apple is very cautious about this, and this is something that's built into their DNA. Is they don't rush out a crappy product. Uh, they well, hopefully they don't rush out a crappy product and say okay it didn't work. They're very cautious about the markets they enter, which is why they did not enter the TV market, even though they were long rumored to. You know, they have a player, of course, the Apple TV, which sells very well, and I have it, and I love it. Right. I don't know. If, I don't know if it's the best, but it's not a failure by any stretch. It's it's very powerful, and it does what it, it says. So the markets they enter typically tend to be established markets. This is a new market. You'll notice Apple never got into touchscreen computers, right? They never got into a lot of things that Microsoft did or Google did. They never got into the 3D gimmick. They never got into any of this stuff. And 3D failed. In fact, did you see, by the way, going on to the video game thing, 3D is officially dead now, today. Today, it's dead. Do you know why? Why is that? Uh, because the most successful 3D product of all time was a video game console by Nintendo. It's called the 3DS. Now, 
about a year and a half ago or so, they brought out a version called the 2DS, which of course stripped the stripped the 3D out, but in a cheap system. Today they announced the 2DS XL, which is basically a 3DS system without the 3D the way it should be with a clamshell. Nintendo has given up on 3D. It's done. Yep. It was a gimmick that never worked. Now, it's not to say it's not cool, but as a consumer thing, there's no demand for it. And I believe this is what's going to happen with 3D. I'm not sorry, with 3D, with, uh, with VR. It's a cool product. But if the person, if the company behind it can't convince you to do it, then at some point you, they have to realize this. Apple's into the, the self-driving car business. Now, let's be clear here. Apple's not manufacturing the cars. I don't think there's any evidence for that. I think no. the car that was spotted, was it a Lexus? Was it like a, a Lexus SUV? Yeah. They, yeah, um, yeah. Of course it's a Lexus. It's not going to be a Honda. But, oh, Apple. But, but the fact of the matter is we've seen that we've seen autonomous driving with, uh, with, with Teslas, with Ubers, with Googles, probably with others. And, there, and what's, what's beginning to happen and, is that we're starting to find out that the technology is really rough. It's very rough, and I, I know Google for a while we used to brag, oh, we've never had accidents. Yeah, that was BS. They had lots of accidents. They just didn't re- – what they qualify as an accident. If the technology were to come out tomorrow, if the technology were to just to, to come onto the streets tomorrow, I would actually think, Ben, from, yeah. the, uh, from the reports I've seen, that more accidents would be caused by human drivers bashing into the things. That but, there, there is a lot of proof for that. I mean, Google did spend about three years testing their equipment before they got into an accident where uh, the Google self-driving car was responsible or at fault for the accident. But they had had numerous, dozens upon dozens of accidents where human drivers were being aggressive when they shouldn't have been and hit the car and caused an accident. So accidents do happen in self-driving cars. It's just, you know, who's at fault? Well, eh, eh. Well, here's the thing, though. Google makes a couple of good products. They make they make Gmail. They make Google Search. Uh, you know, they make Android operating system. None of those things are flawless. None of those things. None of those things work perfect all the time. They but they do work perfect most of the time. So the moments that that screw us up, the you know, when the email doesn't load or or something glitches, it ruins our day because we expect it to work all the time. That's acceptable on your computer. When your car <laughs> crashes. That's not acceptable, and all it takes is one time. But but human beings, specifically Americans, have gotten so desensitized to car violence, we don't even blink an eye. Ca- more people die of car-related injuries than almost anything else in this country. Look at the statistics. Preventable car deaths kill more Americans than, I believe, anything else that is preventable. We're right. talking smoking. We're talking gunshots. We're talking terrorism. We're talking everything. And we joke about it. We even say, oh, flying's you know safer than cars. But we love our car so much, we will put ourselves in that position of possibly dying in vehicular homicide. We love cars. Our entire nation is built on cars. We love cars. We love racing them. Fast and the Furious makes a billion dollars because we like seeing cars dropped out of helicopters and fighting, <laughs> fighting torpedoes Absolutely. in the Arctic. Absolutely. Absolutely. We, lo- we love cars, man. But the problem is we also love driving cars. And I think this is the problem that we're going to get to eventually. Now, I do think that, like, we talked about Linux a few seconds ago. Let's be honest here, you Linux people. You love the operating system not because it's flexible, but because you can tinker with it. Because you can get in there and screw around with it and make it do what you want to do. It's flexible. It's very versatile. But I'm sorry, but with cars, people prefer automatic now. There are car hounds that prefer manual, but you're very few and far between. Because people want to be able to drive their car, eat spaghetti... And, and text on their iPhone while they're talking to Siri on Bluetooth. I've seen that, yeah. They want to, they can read books. <laughs> I've seen that, yeah. So, and, and, and you know, I, I really don't know if people love to drive as much as people love to get around. And of they, course, uh, yeah, you're so. right. Yeah, I mean, I apologize. I, I should go back and restate right. that. Ben's right. But the fact of the matter is, anything that puts the control away from these bozos that would right. endanger me from their stupidity, I'm all for. That being said, that being said, you know, we talk about automation. This is going to happen. Automated yeah. cars are going to happen. It's not going to stop unless the apocalypse, ha- unless North Korea nukes us, it's going to happen. That's a long and so, shot. So yeah. Well, you never know. I mean, there's, 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 you never know. But any, 
anyway, we're, but it's we're, going we're to happen, not, Ben. Right, right, right. We're not insinuating that. And, of course, Apple jumping into this, that is uh, something interesting. But I'm sure yes. if it's anything like Apple, we will not see a product until everyone else is out on the market. And then Apple will do it better than everyone else. So, yeah. And, we'll, uh, yeah hmm? Exactly. It's it, if, if it happens, it happens. And it's fun to speculate. But I, here's, I think the point we're both trying to make is that Apple legitimizes the program in a way something like if Microsoft was doing it does it like oh Apple's doing it so we're going to pay more attention we're going to see what happens right. that being said Ben we will also see if Apple pulls out of it the same way they do the TV so right, right. We'll keep watching yep and, and absolutely and we're going to move on to another uh, change by Apple but real quick I have something to mention about one of our sponsors and mm. ZipRecruiter so for everyone out there if you're hiring do you know where to post your job to find the best candidates? Well, posting your job in one place isn't enough to find quality candidates. And if you want the perfect hire, you need to post all of your jobs on all of the top job sites. And guess what? Now you can. Where, of course, with ZipRecruiter.com, you can post your job to up to 100 plus job sites. 100, that's right. Including social media networks like Facebook and Twitter, all with a single click. Because I hear... All the best candidates are on Twitter. That's where you find the best mm -hmm. people. They're gorgeous people. But yeah, so find candidates in any city or industry nationwide where just post once and watch your qualified candidates roll into ZipRecruiter's easy-to-use interface. So no juggling emails or calls to your office where you can quickly screen candidates, rate them, and hire the right person fast, again, all through their online portal. Very, very simple. So, find out today why ZipRecruiter has been used by Fortune 100 companies and thousands, I repeat, thousands of small and medium-sized businesses. So, right now, our listeners can try ZipRecruiter.com by posting a job absolutely free at ZipRecruiter.com forward slash free trial. Again, ZipRecruiter.com slash free trial, and you'll be able to post for free, find that right person for the right job, and hey, you can thank Computer America for that. Nathan, uh, again, hmm. we are jumping back in with you, and that's right. So we just uh, wrapped up with Apple and the self-driving car. We'll see what happens, but if it, honestly, I don't see anything. Really, I don't see any kind of self-driving car. You know, we're seeing like self-driving cars with, uh, well, normal cars with assisted self-driving mechanisms. You know, lane keep you, or sensors that don't let you smash into the person in front of you, like things like that. But I'm betting we won't see true autonomous cars for another three, four, five years minimum, and Apple will not be the first one to bring it to market. So, No, of course not. So we yeah, have time. exactly. So we have time. So, But one thing that I do see Apple doing, and this is something that, you know, I've started using PayPal more often because I like giving, uh, you know, Elon Musk all of my money uh, by <laughs> using PayPal. So I've been using PayPal more, and I'll be honest, the flexibility and just the ease of use compared to a traditional bank, I really do like PayPal. And... You know, we, we see this happen with uh, Facebook. They started doing money as well. Uh, Snapchat, I think, which is actually like a Facebook su subsidiary at this point, but whatever. Uh, a lot of these online services and a lot of different services that are not banks are trying to get into the money racket. So Apple getting into sending money and receiving money, mm. how, how do you think this is shaping up? Well, I think Apple should should be in charge of the market for the most part because they're actually one of the biggest players. Now you talked about PayPal, right? Right. You know, good old good old Elon Musk company right there, right? Yeah. But yeah, his biggest success. You know. But the fact of the matter is the fact of the matter is is that PayPal was an innovator that that didn't quite innovate when it came to taking money off the web. Now they have things like credit card or debit cards and prepaid cards and and linked bank accounts. That's fantastic. And Google Google of course had had multiple attempts. I believe they had um you have to forgive me. I know that there was one called Google Wallet, which I actually use, by the way. I actually like Google Wallet quite a bit. But there was another one that didn't uh, – Google Money or something that didn't yeah. quite work. Yeah, had the, to be the, phased there, out. There was a service that let you like kind of email. Like, like it's tied in with all their other systems, and it kind of let you like email money as well. But that didn't catch on as, you know, as well. And there's so many others. Walmart has their own brand, HP, Samsung. But here's the thing. We talked about Apple going into a market and sort of legitimizing the market. And by the way, so we're talking about um, NFC, which is near field communication. And for a long, long time, the iPhones didn't have this have this service, but Android phones did. And Android phones would brag about, oh, we have NFC. We can't do anything with it, but we got it because NFC was popular in places like rural China's area or Taiwan or Hong Kong. A lot of vendors would use NFC for micropayments because 
believe it or not, people outside of the United States, a lot of cool stuff is happening. But it happens in it happens in smaller areas, test markets where there's fewer regulation. Some would say that uh, a lot of American innovation and ingenuity has been stifled by this. And in the United States, we have something called the FDIC, which is a banking inst- which part of the federal government that regulates transa- uh, money transactions between devices between banks and whatnot. Now, this money also helps guarantee that your money won't be stolen by by terrorists, mm-hmm. which is why you shouldn't be using Bitcoin because, frankly, Bitcoin is stupid and it doesn't work. That being said, that being said, Apple ha- Apple came out with something called Apple Pay years ago when they introduced NFC. And I will tell you this: as someone who's been on both sides of the aisle, I remember months and months before e- Apple even announced it, all the signs were there. And I don't know if I was on the Computer America show when this first started happening. But I'd get reports that Panera Bread was installing NFC players, that McDonald's was installing NFC players. And that co- that correlated with the stories that Apple would introduce NFC. Because once Apple got into the market, people took this seriously. And when Apple brought out Apple Pay, it became wildly successful. In fact, if you use NFC, if you pay with your cell phone at most places, you have Apple to thank for that. Because Apple pushed the industry forward in a way that other companies couldn't. And this goes back to our other point with self-driving cars and, and VR and whatever. Mm-hmm. You need a company that understands how the market works, and you have and they have to play with how the market functions. Now, the idea that you pay for a Happy Meal with your iPhone sounded ridiculous years ago, but now people just do it. They don't even think about it. Yeah. Oh, pay with your movie ticket. Apple should Apple should have been on this years ago. That being said, that being said. Uh, I don't know who your bank is. I don't know who your bank card is, but my bank, uh, I have a debit card. And on my debit card, it says, uh, I think it says Visa. Right. And some say MasterCard. That's Those cards are pretty much accepted everywhere because they're a protocol standard that you can use online. You could use at McDonald's. You could use Walmart. You could use to buy a terrorism card. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, but, the sta- but the codex, the APIs, as you will, that, that functions with the transactions, you could use that plastic debit card if you're willing to type in the numbers pretty much everywhere. And your cards have been updated with chips. But with it, when it comes to these transaction payments, Ben, like PayPal and Google Wallet and uh, and Apple Pay, they're I not think, compatible. I, I, I think what you're getting at is something I also found because, you know, again, as I shift more and more money into uh, PayPal, because, you know, recently I purchased a bunch of parts for my computer and I was looking mm-hmm. to, of course, pay for the parts using my PayPal account. You know who you know who is the biggest pain in the butt when you're trying to do it through PayPal? And that is Amazon. You were just talking about oh, the yes. You, yes. You, you were just talking about the standardization of the plastic debit card and those numbers. Well, the problem is fragmentation right now and right now PayPal is not accepted everywhere. Apple is not accepted or Apple Pay is not accepted everywhere. This fragmentation is going to kill this if you don't have some kind of standard. Well, and that and that really comes down and you could actually blame Apple for that too <laughs> because Apple has the App Store, right? And right. And they will not accept certain types of payments. You have to if you you if you you have an Apple account, you have to go through the ringer. You have to verify this, verify that. But a big a complaint was is that if you you purchase something through the Apple Store, a percentage goes to uh, like one third of the percentage goes to Apple to to facilitate this. And for vendors that were trying to sell products and services through the Apple Store to make money, including by the way Netflix, including uh, uh, including iBook sales. You know, including subscription sales. Uh, Am- in fact, Amazon had a service called Audible. You know, the audiobook thing. Yeah. They will not allow you to buy books on Apple. You can't do it. You have to go. You have to go to a separate app or whatnot because they don't. They don't want to comply with Apple's rules. But they want. But they know they have to have the service on iPhone, right? right. Because that. Because everyone wants to have their own ecosystem. And Ninety The next seconds. big phase is controlling the money system as well. And to, they are to make, of to course, make money's proprietary. Right. Yeah. And, and, and of course, Apple is looking to get into this, so expect uh, big announcements coming from that. Uh, according to the article here, they are essentially calling it Apple Pay for the web. So if you use Apple Pay now, it's essentially for the web. So I hate to cut you off, Nathan, but we have like a minute left. This hour flew by. So it did, and what, I was late too. So I yay. know. So what is happening? Well, not yay. That was awful. But uh, what is happening over at popzara.com? Sixty and, uh, what seconds. What can we look forward to? Well, uh, let me just let me do a little self-promoting. Uh, I got a bunch of really great podcasts. We're having a new feature where I actually pair the editors with legitimate sites that are better than. Po- no, I'm just kidding. Better. <laughs> no, we have we have podcasts. But, uh, we have team ups with sites like Engadget now, where we do cross promotion. 
you know, we uh, we have one coming up today uh, with the Daily Mail talking about games like Ukulele or Persona 5. Fascinating stuff. So if you don't like Pop Zara and you enjoy it and gadget a Daily Mail, well, there you go. You win. Um, I also want to self-promote my other project, which is Safe Spaces, because I'm very proud uh, we're going to have an episode that covers the upcoming uh, – the new Netflix show, The Bill Nye Saves the World Show, and what a disaster that thing is. So – <laughs> the fact of the fun yeah. stuff all around a- a- absolutely oh, and, and no no absolutely and of course you can check more out at 10 seconds Nathan, we are just flat out of time thank you so much and again looking forward to next month it's uh you know a lot of fun yes and uh and linux people don't kill us we love you <laughs> we love absolutely you. so everyone have a great weekend and please tune back in tomorrow uh i'm sorry monday 4 p.m to 5 p.m <laughs> eastern everyone have a great weekend bye-bye everyone bye-bye